Go ahead, Mina. Okay, great. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, I am going to um, host today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Brian Bergmark uh, joining us today to talk about uh, left main uh, disease and revascularization for left main. Uh, so um, by way of bio, Dr. Bergmark is an investigator with the Timmy study group and an interventional cardiologist in the chronic total occlusion and complex coronary intervention program at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard. He had his BA from Stanford and MD from Harvard and uh, continued uh, in Boston uh, with his uh, internal medicine, cardiology, and interventional cardiology at the Brigham. His research interests are complex coronary interventions and acute coronary syndromes. Uh, the topic today, revascularization for left main coronary artery disease. Uh, Brian was the co-principal author on this uh, uh, recent Lancet publication, and uh, his paper was also presented as part of a very highly regarded featured science session at the AHA in November of uh, 2021. So uh, take it away, Brian. Thank you for joining us. Th thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm very grateful and look forward to this conversation. So I'm just going to pull up the slides here. And, and of course, uh, for everyone, please feel free to interrupt, uh, bring up issues as they arise, like for this to be a conversation. Um, but in the meantime, I'll just keep uh, plowing through the slides. So here are the disclosures. That looks great, Brian. Um... We have, uh, we have some senior surgeons who are here as well, so I, I look forward to uh, hearing what they is, they're going to ask you later. So that, thanks a lot. Beautiful. Thank you. I, that, that's ideal, and I appreciate and look forward to those comments. And so uh, here is the overview of the talk today. First, a brief discussion of left main coronary artery disease, followed by the four major trials of PCI with drug-eluting stents versus cabbage the controversy uh, that followed uh, the presentation of these data, uh, how that led to an individual patient data analysis, what we did and found, and then some conclusions. So we'll, we'll speak first about left main coronary artery disease. And I, I want to start with three cases I will show briefly. And the purpose of showing these is one, to highlight that while we talk about left main coronary artery disease as a single entity, it of course is not. And there are diverse coronary anatomies and diverse patients uh, with the coronary anatomies. And so I, I want to also then uh, have that uh, spur in your mind how you would treat these patients and whether you would feel comfortable randomizing each of these patients in a trial because that uh, colors the interpretation of our evidence base. So this first case is a 59-year-old gentleman with stable angina, type 2 diabetes, and EF of 45%, and no major comorbidities. As you can see, there's a short left main, heavily diseased distally into the ostia of the LAD and the circumflex, and heavily calcified. There's some diffuse disease otherwise as well. The second case is an 88-year-old woman with an NSTEMI, no diabetes, low EF, stage 3 kidney disease, and severe COPD. You can see there is a distal left main lesion as well as some disease in this circumflex in this view. And then the third case is a 70 year old woman with an NSTEMI, no diabetes, normal EF, mild COPD, and a focal osteal left main lesion. So the, the clinical importance of left main coronary artery disease has been uh, known for some time. This is a report from 1912 from Dr. Herrick in Chicago, where he describes uh, acute coronary syndromes, not just left main disease, but he, he has here a, a case of a patient, 55, uh, with uh, acute onset chest discomfort. And then as you can see highlighted or underlined in red, his physician was called who found him cold, nauseated with a small rapid pulse and suffering extreme pain. The, the patient expired, and you can see on the autopsy underlined in red, a short distance from its origin, the left coronary artery was completely obliterated by a red thrombus that had formed at a point of great narrowing. He goes on and ultimately concludes at the bottom, death is the result in nearly all of these cases. And on the left is the modern correlate from a recent patient in the cath lab uh, with this exact problem. You can see the flow in the aorta corresponding to this description of a small rapid pulse. And so 
It wasn't until many years later that we had some evidence about how to manage this disease entity. Uh, this is from the VA cooperative study, 686 men with coronary artery disease. They were randomized to bypass surgery versus medical therapy, which of course at the time was not much. There were 91 patients in the left main subgroup, and that was defined as a left main stenosis of at least 50%. And as you can see on the right, those who got bypass surgery had significantly improved survival compared to those who did not out to 42 months. There were some early observational data. These are from Duke, a retrospective analysis. Uh, there were 3,246 patients who had a coronary angiogram identifying CAD, and they were simply categorized by whether they were treated medically versus surgically, so non-randomized, and this is confounded. Uh, but what you can see here is a gradient of the association on the right between revascularization and adjusted survival probability with uh, a striking association on the bottom right for patients with left main coronary artery disease. And then in the mid 1990s, uh, there was a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials comparing bypass surgery versus medical therapy, seven trials, 2,600 patients. And if you look at those highlighted in red toward the bottom of the table, those with left main disease, while small in number uh, and a total small number of deaths, uh, there was a uh, significantly uh, reduced odds of death through five years with bypass surgery. So cabbage was the early standard of care for left main coronary artery disease. Percutaneous angioplasty was developed in the late 1970s. There were some early small randomized trials of bare metal stents versus cabbage, which favored cabbage, lower rates of revasc, MI, possible mortality, those small studies. And then stent technology improved by the early 2000s. And so that brought about the question, what about comparing drug eluding stents versus bypass surgery? And so then that brings us to the four trials comparing PCI with drug eluding stents versus cabbage, Syntax, Precombat, Noble, and Excel. And so I'll go through each of these briefly. The Syntax trial, of course, was not limited to patients with left main disease. Uh, also, they could have three vessel disease. There were 1,800 patients. Uh, equivalent revascularization was considered possible between bypass surgery and PCI. That is true for each of these studies. So I'm not going to say that each time, but that's critically important to remember that a multidisciplinary team considered these patients equally treatable by either approach. The definition of left main coronary artery disease was a lesion of at least 50% or a biosteal disease, Medina 011, or three vessel disease. They were randomized one to one to PCI or cabbage. PCI was with a first generation drug eluding stent. And the primary endpoint was death, stroke, MI, or repeat revascularization through one year. And so these are the primary findings of the Syntex trial, again, not limited to those with left main coronary artery disease. As you can see, death from any cause, not statistically significant at one year. Uh, if you add stroke or MI in panel B, similar through 12 months, repeat revascularization in panel C, quite different, much higher after PCI. And then when you combine all of these into their primary composite endpoint in the bottom right, significantly higher after PCI. One of the central observations of the Syntax trial was the importance of the Syntax score. So I know this is familiar to this group, uh, but this score was designed as a method to, uh, to force the enrolling sites to systematically review the coronary angiogram of potential subjects. And so uh, features that increase complexity of coronary artery disease are scored for each lesion, and then a sum is generated for a patient. And uh, it turns out that the score has importance far beyond the original purpose. And so on the right is uh, the primary endpoint uh, comparison for cabbage or PCI with the patients stratified by their syntax score. So those with a low score, 0 to 22, in the top in panel A, there was no difference between bypass surgery and PCI. For intermediate scores, 23 to 32, there was no statistically significant difference at 12 months, though I think a reasonable person might wonder where those curves are headed over time. And then for a high syntax score, uh, clearly higher rate of these events after PCI. The left main cohort had 705 patients. 
As you can see in panel A, there was no statistically significant difference in the primary endpoint at 12 months, no difference in death, MI. Uh, and then stroke on the right was higher after cabbage, revask higher after PCI, and then the composite of death stroke or MI not different at 12 months. So that then brings us to the pre-combat trial. And so this is where we start getting into limiting patients uh, by coronary criteria, whereas syntax was philosophically meant to be an all comers trial. For the remaining uh, three trials, there are different manners of limiting the complexity of the patients. Uh, so left main uh, stenosis of at least 50%, no plan to treat at more than one CTO and no EF less than 30%. There were 600 patients randomized one to one. The PCI again was with a first generation drug eluting stent. And importantly, there was pre specified angiographic follow up in the PCI arm at eight to 10 months. <clears throat> the primary endpoint was death stroke MI or ischemia driven target vessel revast through one year. And here is what they found. Uh, so this actually goes out to two years. The primary comparison was at one year non-inferiority with a quite wide non-inferiority margin. Uh, so it met the non-inferiority margin, uh, but as I said, it was quite wide. And then the hazard ratio here is for superiority at two years, uh, 1.50 not meeting statistical significance. Uh, and then you can see that uh, there is a, a change in the slope of the curve at eight to 10 months in the PCI arm in blue during that period of uh, angiographic follow-up. If you remove the ischemia-driven target vessel revask on the right, just death stroke or MI, no significant difference between treatment arms at two years. And the hazard ratio for death at the bottom of the slide was 0.69 with a wide 95% confidence interval. And so the 2014 European guidelines uh, were largely informed by these two trials. You can see that the framework for these was to stratify by syntax score, that cabbage has a class one indication regardless of coronary anatomical complexity with a level of evidence of B. And then for PCI, uh, a class one recommendation for low syntax score, 2A for intermediate and three for high syntax score. Again, all level of evidence B. And so then that brings us into the two newer trials. So noble uh, left main disease was at least 50% or an FFR less than or equal to 0.80. Uh, and then three or fewer other complex lesions, which could be a CTO, bifurcation, or calcified or tortuous vessel. There are 1,200 patients, randomized one-to-one. -one. And the primary comparison was death stroke non-procedural MI or repeat revascularization uh, through five years. So a different approach to MI than pre-combat and a different approach to repeat revascularization. And as you can see here, significantly higher after PCI, hazard ratio of 1.46 uh, through five years. These are the components of that composite, no difference in death, significantly high rates of non-procedural MI and repeat revascularization, and no difference in stroke. Uh, we can talk about this more later, but a distinct finding compared to the other trials, lower after PCI initially, and then there was a higher rate of uh, stroke uh, with PCI after one year. And then the Excel trial. Uh, here there were 1,900 patients. Left main disease was defined as a lesion of at least 70% angiographically or 50 to 70% plus evidence of ischemia, which could be non-invasive or invasive. And then here, a syntax score uh, was the criterion of less than or equal to 32, so specifically low to intermediate syntax scores. Randomized one-to-one, -one, and then the primary endpoint was death stroke or MI uh, through three years. And here are the primary findings. Uh, as you can see on the left for the primary composite endpoint, there was no difference at three years, the different shapes of those curves and how they arrived at similar rates at three years. So initially a high rate after cabbage uh, and then a relatively shallow slope, whereas after PCI, a lower initial incidence of events followed by a, a steeper slope out through three years. And then death from any cause, I show here because this becomes a point of focus later. No difference at three years, though again, a person might wonder uh, where those curves are headed at this time point. 
For stroke, no difference through three years. Myocardial infarction, uh, this is all myocardial infarctions, including procedural as well as spontaneous events, no difference in three years, though the point I made about the primary composite endpoint and the shapes of the curves, uh, as you can see here, applies to the myocardial infarction. And so that's where things stood in 2018. And the structure of the European guidelines was uh, similar uh, based on syntax score, though the level of evidence uh, was increased to A for uh, most of these other than for uh, high syntax score and PCI. And so that uh, was how things were in 2018. And that uh, brings us to the controversy. And so this all really uh, came to a head with the presentation of the five-year follow-up data from the Excel trial at TCT in the autumn of 2019. And so as you can see here, the uh, primary endpoint death stroke or myocardial infarction is shown. Uh, there was no statistically significant difference. The curves crossed uh, about two years, two and a half years. Um, with a rate of 22% in the PCI arm, 19% uh, in the cabbage arm. And then if you put in ischemia-driven revascularization on the right, significantly higher after PCI. The odds ratio for death was 1.38 with a hazard ratio, 95% uh, confidence interval of 1.03 to 1.85. So significantly higher odds of death after PCI. And so the, the reaction to the presentation and the simultaneous publication in the New England Journal of Medicine was uh, swift and vigorous. And there were several issues uh, that were raised. Uh, this is not an exhaustive uh, list of those, uh, but these are several that uh, one had a sort of scientific basis that could be debated. Um, and really were the, the central items. So the first was the interpretation of the mortality difference in the five-year results paper. So as mentioned, that was just significantly higher after PCI. Uh, and uh, some were concerned that that difference was not given adequate attention in the presentation or the paper, uh, with the argument being that even though it was a secondary endpoint, uh, that it's mortality. And that's ultimately what matters most the counter argument was that the overall findings were neutral and that this was a secondary endpoint among many without adjustment for uh, multiple comparisons. This uh, issue is then related to some of the event definitions and the choice of the primary endpoint, uh, with the argument being that if some of these other items had been defined differently, perhaps this would not be considered neutral at five years. And so one of these items was procedural MI uh, with the uh, allegation that uh, a definition of procedural MI was chosen to favor PCI as compared to cabbage, and that rates of uh, procedural MI as defined by the universal definition of MI rather than the protocol definition had not been reported. The choice of the primary composite endpoint, whereas other trials had included revascularization, Excel did not. Uh, this is a question of intent, as is, is much of this, with some arguing that the intent of leaving out revascularization was to favor PCI, uh, with the trial team uh, defending their choice, saying that revascularization is not clinically comparable to stroke or death, uh, and that it's only included in other trials uh, to increase power, and that, uh, and that Excel was much larger than other trials. And ultimately, these uh, led to this hashtag of chocolate trial, which was a new term to me, uh, but with the idea being that a trial is designed based on the choice of endpoints, definitions, et cetera, to achieve a result that is desired by those designing the trial. And so this led to a real standstill in the field. And it's, it, in order to, uh, to, to unravel this and also explain why we did what we did in the uh, meta-analysis, we have to get into procedural MI. This is a rabbit hole and we could spend all day talking about it. So I want to show enough here to be transparent and explain our reasoning, uh, but I, without getting totally bogged down in this uh, controversial topic. 
So to start, this is everywhere at this point. Uh, and the implications of defining procedural MI are important. So the primary findings of the Excel trial are shown in the left, uh, but this is also relevant to the ischemia trial and many other trials that have been presented recently. And so getting into the ischemia trial to show as another example, if you disaggregate MI into procedural and spontaneous, you can see that uh, there's a higher rate of procedural MI in the invasive strategy arm, of course. Uh, and then there's actually a lower rate of spontaneous MI uh, in the invasive uh, arm uh, on the right. And so one, this highlights that combining them uh, in this way actually puts together two endpoints that go in opposite directions, which is problematic, but two also uh, makes you susceptible to your definition of these events. Now, spontaneous MI definitions tend to be pretty homogeneous, uh, but procedural MI definitions vary enormously. And so to look at this in the ischemic trial, the results on the left are using the protocol definition of procedural MI uh, for the primary composite endpoint. But if you use a lower biomarker threshold and make these events more common, you shift the entire curve in the invasive arm upward, uh, and it appears worse uh, compared to the conservative arm. And that's simply based on your choice of defining this one event type that I think most would argue or is of the least clinical importance. And so what are some common definitions? One is the universal definition of MI. Uh, in, in the fourth universal definition, as in prior versions, troponin is favored over CKMB. There are different biomarker thresholds for PCI versus cabbage. So there's a lower threshold to define an event as an MI after PCI than there is after cabbage. And then ECG imaging or angiographic findings are required to support the diagnosis. The SKY clinically relevant MI after revascularization is another commonly used definition. CKMB is favored, it's less sensitive. And there can either be an equivalent high standalone biomarker threshold for PCI or cabbage. So the same threshold and high, or there can be a lower biomarker threshold that's cross paired with ECG changes. This is from a paper in 2018 in circulation where a group uh, discussing the relevance of these definitions to the Excel trial, uh, looking just at an observational cohort of people who had undergone PCI or cabbage, showed how discrepant these event rates are uh, based on the definition. Uh, they looked at different uh, universal definitions of MI and then the SKY definition, uh, where there's a much higher rate after bypass surgery than after PCI. In the Excel trial, the definition of procedural MI is similar to the SKY definition. Actually, the, the protocol predates the publication of the SKY definition. There are minor differences. It's often discussed as being synonymous, uh, but I think for, for all practical purposes, is, is similar to the SKY definition. And so this was uh, one of the central uh, concerns was that as a secondary endpoint that was pre-specified, in the Excel trial, they would look at procedural MI defined according to the universal definition of MI uh, that was not immediately presented. And, and again, there was a question of intent raised. Was that uh, being withheld or was that simply being looked at uh, like many other secondary endpoints, uh, which takes some time uh, to, to get out there? Of course, the allegation was uh, the former. And so the, uh, the Excel trial leadership provided some of this information in a letter uh, in response in the New England Journal of Medicine and then published a paper in 2020 in Jack uh, detailing uh, event rates according to different definitions of procedural MI. And as you can see in uh, the, the area highlighted in red here, these are the, this is the primary composite endpoint with that uh, component of procedural MI defined differently. And for the protocol to define MI while numerically higher after PCI is not statistically significant, if you change simply the definition of procedural MI to the universal definition of MI, the entire primary composite endpoint becomes statistically significantly higher after PCI. So the entire conclusion of the uh, comparison changes based on the definition of this event type. 
And so uh, with, with these several items in mind and some others as well, uh, there were calls for an independent transparent analysis of the aggregate randomized trial data. And so that brings us to an individual patient data meta-analysis um, that uh, was presented at AHA. And so the approach here was that a collaboration was formed between a group of independent investigators and the principal investigators of the four trials. And I think it's important to point out that this group of independent investigators was balanced with one cardiac surgeon and one interventional cardiologist. And given the tenor of the, the discussion in this area, it's also important to emphasize that we as the independent investigators created the statistical analysis plan. We performed all analyses, we drafted the manuscript, had complete control over the content and vouched for the integrity of the analyses and the findings. So a one stage meta analytic approach was used on a combined data set of individual patient data supplied by each trial. The primary endpoint was all cause mortality through five years. Uh, we chose this endpoint because it was unambiguous and also the most clinically relevant. There were five secondary endpoints, cardiovascular death, spontaneous MI, procedural MI, stroke, and repeat coronary revascularization. We intentionally disaggregated spontaneous and procedural MI. We did landmark analyses, supplemental analyses using 10-year mortality data which was available in syntax and pre-combat and subgroup analyses and Bayesian analyses to help quantify the probability and magnitude of any difference in mortality. These are the baseline and procedural characteristics. So all 4,394 patients were judged by a multidisciplinary team to be equally suitable candidates for either PCI or cabbage, uh, which bears emphasizing throughout. The median age was 66, three quarters were men, one quarter had diabetes, a small portion had an EF less than 50%. The median syntax score is about 25. A small portion had left main only disease and about half had left main plus at least two vessel disease. The median number of stents or conduits was two. IVUS was used in about two thirds of the PCI. Uh, Lima in 96% of the surgeries and all arterial grafting in 23%. So here's the primary comparison of mortality through five years, 11.2% after PCI, 10.2% after cabbage, hazard ratio of 1.10, 95% confidence interval of 0 0.91 to 1.32. The absolute difference was 0.9% uh, with the confidence interval from negative 0.9 to 2.8%. So uh, we wanted to dig into this a bit more. This is the Bayesian analysis of mortality. So the dotted line is centered at zero, which would indicate no difference in mortality between these two treatment strategies. And anything to the right is a mortality difference that favors cabbage, so higher mortality after PCI. You can see that the curve is shifted to the right. And to quantify that, there was an 86% probability that mortality was greater with PCI versus cabbage. So any difference greater than zero. To look at some more specific thresholds, there was a 49% probability that the mortality difference between PCI and cabbage was at least 1% over five years, or 0.2% per year. And there was a 5% probability the mortality difference between PCI and cabbage was at least 2.5% over five years. So from this, we concluded that, that mortality was probably higher after PCI and that an absolute risk difference more likely than not was less than 0.2% per year. Here's cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular mortality, no significant difference there. For CV mortality here out through five years, the hazard ratio is 1.07, difference 0.4%, absolutely not statistically significantly different. And there were two trials with 10-year mortality data, syntax and pre-combat. So you can see 22.1% after cabbage, 21.6% after PCI, hazard ratio of 0 0.96, p-value of 0 0.72. What about subgroups? So this is a fraught issue and needs to be uh, taken with care. We are not adjusting for multiple comparisons. We did pay attention to the syntax score because of our understanding of its importance in other settings. And while not statistically significant in terms of interaction here, it does appear that there could be a cabbage, a benefit with cabbage uh, 
uh, for those with high syntax scores. So we looked into this a little bit further. Here's cardiovascular mortality with syntax score modeled continuously. The P interaction here is 0 0.15. So again, I want to emphasize this is not statistically significant. Uh, but I, I do think a reasonable person taking into account what is known about the importance of coronary complexity in other settings, you know, um, uh, might wonder if we had a larger study, uh, if there would be something significant here. The curve appears to favor cabbage right around a syntax score of 33. And my repeat revascularization is uh, unequivocally higher after PCI, twofold higher for spontaneous MI, and repeat revascularization, as you can see here, significantly higher after PCI, hazard ratio of 1.78, number needed to treat with bypass surgery to prevent one revascularization through five years of 14. Procedural MI, so the protocol definitions are shown on the left, significantly lower after PCI odds ratio of 0 0.65. When these events are defined by the universal definition of MI, which was available in syntax and Excel, no significant difference, uh, though a reverse trend numerically higher after PCI. And then stroke. Uh, no difference through five years, though there was a violation of the proportional hazards assumption. Within the first year, significantly lower after PCI, has a ratio of 0 0.37, an absolute difference of 1%, and no difference after the first year. And I think for this particular endpoint, it is biologically plausible that there would be a difference within the first year, uh, less clear why there would be a difference after one year. So in summary, comparing PCI with drug-eluting stents versus cabbage in patients with left main coronary artery disease, a median syntax score of 25 and deemed equally suitable candidates for either revascularization approach. There was no statistically significant difference in survival at five years and at 10 years, but a Bayesian approach suggested a difference favoring cabbage probably exists, and more likely than not, it is less than 0.2% per year in magnitude. A possible cardiovascular mortality benefit of cabbage appeared confined to patients with high syntax scores. Cabbage unequivocally uh, results in lower rates of spontaneous MI and repeat revascularization, and PCI has lower rates of early stroke. The differences in the risk of procedural MI depended on the definition used. So, so this, of course, needs to be taken into uh, account for each specific patient. Uh, which account for the coronary anatomy, local expertise, non-coronary anatomical features, patient preferences, et cetera. And so the, the question is, where do we go from here? And so it's important to emphasize again that these findings apply to a subset of patients with left main disease. Equivalent revascularization was considered possible. Largely low to intermediate anatomical complexity and limited comorbidity. So this is different than uh, the group of patients who we see in routine clinical practice. And so one of the responses to these data is that a large trial with the latest surgical and PCI techniques is needed. Uh, you know, that would be nice, uh, but one, it's difficult to achieve adequate power for mortality difference. So such a trial would take quite some time to enroll uh, and would be a challenge. And there's always a tension between long-term follow-up and state-of-the-art revask. So, Certainly by the time such a trial were designed and executed and we had five-year follow-up, we'd be wondering about the latest uh, techniques. So in the near term, we, we've got to work with what we've got. And, and I would actually say uh, that perhaps refining the mortality difference point estimate is not the major issue here. Uh, I think for everybody who takes part in these conversations on a regular basis, if we could with more confidence say that the mortality difference is 0.15% per year or 0.3% per year, I, I don't think that changes the conversation. That's not how these decisions are made. Uh, and that very often uh, for patients, this really hinges on a single item or variable for which we don't have a lot of data. For example, they want the approach that's least likely for them to end up on dialysis. Uh, and that's what a lot of these conversations come down to, not a nuanced weighing of statistical considerations. And so to me, the central question going forward is how do we balance patient values and preferences with the small number of hard outcomes for which we have data? 
And is there a role for medical therapy? That's not addressed at all by this uh, set of trials, uh, but I, you know, obviously our recommendations are based on quite data, date, dated comparisons uh, at this point. And so uh, what do the most recent American guidelines say? These were published uh, almost immediately after uh, the, this uh, meta-analysis was presented. So one, in patients with stable ischemic heart disease and significant left main stenosis, cabbage is recommended to improve survival. This is compared to medical therapy. And so this is consistent with prior guidelines and current practice. Uh, there are no new randomized trial data with modern optimal medical therapy. Uh, two, in selected patients with stable ischemic heart disease and significant left main stenosis for whom PCI can provide equivalent revascularization to that possible with cabbage, PCI is reasonable to improve survival. So I think this is logical. Um, it's also, I think, consistent to a large extent with the meta-analysis we just presented. It does leave a major gap in clinical practice, which is not a criticism of the guidelines. It's simply an area where we don't have data. So, uh, and that's really PCI versus medical therapy and prohibitive surgical risk patients with high coronary complexity. So oftentimes we do PCI in patients with left main coronary disease because surgery is considered prohibitively risky, but we don't actually anticipate achieving an equivalent revascularization. For example, we may leave an RCA CTO and we're simply trying to get an elderly patient out of the woods with respect to the left main uh, lesion. Uh, how that compares to medical therapy is not known. In patients who require revascularization for significant left main coronary artery disease with high complexity CAD, it is recommended to choose cabbage over PCI to improve survival. And so I think this is very likely true and supported by our meta-analysis. I do think it may be relevant in some circumstances to consider the magnitude of difference depending on the patient's age, other comorbidities, et cetera. And so this is summarized here in uh, the importance of putting the patient at the center of a multidisciplinary discussion. I don't know that I find this figure to be the most compelling depiction of this, but I, I do think it emphasizes that this, uh, one, the patient is at the center, and then two, that this uh, exists throughout the pre, the peri-procedural, and the post-procedural care. And so let's uh, bring it back to these three cases. So the first was this 59-year-old with stable angina, diabetes, uh, mildly reduced EF. Syntax score was 34. Uh, the STS score is 1.5%. And, and I would be hard pressed to think that anybody would feel comfortable uh, randomizing this person in a trial. Clearly, bypass surgery would be the first preferred approach uh, for this patient. What about the 88-year-old with the NSTEMI? Um, and so here, uh, the syntax score, you know, was elevated, uh, but was considered to have a, a surgical risk that was unreasonable. And so after discussing, we agreed to proceed with uh, PCI, performed a DK crushed uh, stenting here, so to the proximal stroke, left some mild and moderate disease in other parts of the coronary tree, uh, and uh, the patient was discharged home on a ventilator. And then this third case is the one where I think uh, there might be some real equipoise. So out of the three, this is the one, this is the 70 year old with the NSTEMI and really a focal osteo left main lesion, a syntax score of 18, a low surgical risk. And so we had a discussion and this patient had recently had a family member who uh, had a bypass surgery that went very smoothly. Her top priority was being done with this and not having further procedures or events. And so it was clear that for her, a bypass surgery made the most sense. And so she underwent cabbage uh, and was discharged home uh, several days later. So in conclusion, left main coronary artery disease is associated with high mortality. Current revascularization recommendations are informed by four randomized controlled trials. Differences in endpoints and interpretation have led to a standstill in the field. In an individual patient data meta-analysis from the syntax pre-combat Noble and Excel trials, a mortality difference favoring cabbage probably exists. It is more likely than not less than 0.2% per year. And it is likely confined to high anatomical complexity. Higher rates of MI and repeat revascularization occur after PCI. There's a higher rate of stroke in the first year after cabbage. And integrating these findings into patient-centered decision-making is the central challenge moving forward. Uh, so I'll stop there. I want to thank the group again for your time and attention and uh, look forward to having a conversation about this.
Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was a very, very clear presentation. I think you've really reinforced the, the patient-centered approach that happening in heart teams, um, you know, across the country um, uh, currently. Um, and, and some of these cases we really struggle with. I'd really like to uh, um, uh, open up the floor to questions. Maybe if you can stop your screen, uh, your screen share, we could see uh, everyone. Um, Bernie, I do see you on the call. Good morning. It's really nice to have you. Um, Dr. Goldman's one of our senior surgeons, and uh, uh, I would like to invite him to make the opening uh, comments here. Just to, just to unmute, uh, Bernie. We can't, we can't hear you, Bernie. There, good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully I was a little better at surgery than technology. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to hear this uh, study from uh, the Brigham. I finished my training at the Mass General, so I, I feel comfortable always hearing uh, comments from Harvard, and I'm glad that I've lived long enough to see the pendulum swing a touch towards cabbage. Um, I also uh, have uh, drug-eluting stents uh, that are almost 18 years functional, at least according to symptoms and left ventricular function, but I also have 50% left main on optimal medical therapy and seem to be okay. But um, I keep watching what uh, Steve Frames is doing uh, in his studies on arterial revascularization. And I'm delighted that uh, such detailed studies uh, show the importance of the uh, cardiac team approach in analyzing for each individual what is best in terms of perioperative risk, particularly of stroke uh, and of, uh, a, a, you know, a a slight uh, evidence that cabbage, at least done in the modern uh, uh, multi-arterial manner, uh, has a, an advantage over uh, coronary bypass. Uh, I'd be interested to ultimately, when I'm lying on the table and looking at some of your faces, as to whether you can crush my 50% left main or whether the high dose resuvastatin is going to get rid of it by the time I next see you professionally. But congratulations on that uh, beautiful, beautiful study. And I'm delighted to, to have gotten up early to watch it. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And thank you for your, your comments and wisdom and perspective. I, I, as, you, as you highlight, I, I do think this issue of optimal medical therapy is important. And of course, a question would be in which patients, and, and, and I think you've described yourself as the, if there were to be a trial, the exact patient, a, a moderate lesion, probably not something extremely severe, somebody without a high degree of symptoms and probably normalish ejection fraction. Um, and, and I think with uh, aggressive lipid lowering, thinking about what types of antiplatelet therapy, I think there's probably a role in a lot of these patients. And, and we are potentially subjecting patients to revascularization procedures that, that may not be uh, medically necessary, or at least the trade-offs of the different approaches are not known. And I think that is an important area moving forward. Okay. Um, maybe Eric, I could invite you to ask a question. Sure. Thanks very much, Mina. And uh, Brian, thank you for that great talk. You just clarified it so well. And, and thank you for your role in the uh, individual level uh, meta-analysis because it, it contributes a whole lot. The question I want to ask is around uh, acuity or urgency and its interaction with all this information. Because when we sit at you know the Friday morning heart team discussion, there's a mix of stable patients, but there's those in hospital, uh, you know, post ACS, and we run the spectrum in our treatment. When it's a, a acute MI that comes to the cath lab, like the picture you showed, and the left main is clearly the culprit, they get PCI, no discussion. Uh, and uh, when they're totally stable, there's a typical discussion outlining using all the factors you outlined, but there's a, there's a group in between where they're acute, but not as elevation. And uh, 
I think we've struggled with, you know, where does the trade-off or the tipping point happen there? Yeah, I agree completely. I think it's a really important point. Uh, so one is the issue of whether that's reflected in the evidence base at all. And so probably a lot of those patients are not in these trials, you know, and speaks to the generalizability or lack thereof of, of the evidence that we have that somebody who's considered to be too unstable, a decision needs to be made. That's obviously not somebody who's being randomized in a study. We did find that there was a statistically significant interaction between acute coronary syndrome at presentation and uh, mortality uh, between arms at five years. It's tough because it, you know we're looking at a bunch of things. We're not adjusting for multiple testing, but there's also some plausibility there that perhaps these patients are being managed differently. Who's ending up in a trial with an ACS? might be different. Uh, and so we're gonna look into that more. Ultimately, we won't ever really know if this is just random chance, but we're starting to take a look at, are there other baseline differences between these ACS patients versus the stable patients who ended up in these trials? And is there something potentially informative there? Thank you. Okay, next I see Gideon and then Brian. Thanks, Brian. That was uh, really beautifully presented in, in a way that even a surgeon could understand. And I, I am a surgeon. Um, uh, so uh, I guess my question is, in, in, those, in those gray zone patients, um, because as you know, it's all in the presentation. You know, I, I'm not sure a 0.2% per year mortality benefit really resonates with me. Although if I tell my patient there's a mortality benefit, then then you know that then they'll they'll jump to whichever therapy I, I generally recommend. So I guess my question is to you as to how you present the options to your patients, uh, the gray zone patients in particular, uh, in terms of the the benefits and drawbacks of, of either approach. You know, keeping in mind the fact that that you know if it's just a 0.2 percent per year benefit, that maybe there's an advantage of of avoiding surgery and avoiding an incision and avoiding the lengthy recovery, and the stroke risk of early surgery. Yeah, I appreciate that, and this is critically important. Um, how we present this information hugely sways patients, and in particular, what I have a difficult time helping patients to envision is coming back multiple times for repeated revascularization. Uh, it's very easy for them to imagine the discomfort of going through a surgery. It's hard for them to imagine the uncertainty, the frustration of having uh, a lesion that keeps getting ISR, coming back for multiple procedures, not knowing kind of when this is going to come back again. Uh, so at balancing those is difficult, but sort of practically speaking and how we weigh these things, you know, going back to first day of medical school, I, I tend to just open with an open-ended question and try to get from them a sense of their priorities, how they understand their health, what they're hoping for, and help that guide my decision. And if they say, look, I, I'm worried about this, I want to be alive, I say, yeah, we have some data about that. They say, you know what, I've lived a good life. I kind of want to get out of the hospital to see my kid's wedding. That's my top priority. That starts to color my, my discussion with them. And so I, I like to let them lead to the extent possible, particularly for these grade zone cases. And then as directed, get into the weeds a bit more as relevant. But it's hard. It's You can easily, if I go in there and say, hey, we could get you out of the hospital tomorrow going through your wrist. Uh, yeah, maybe there's like a little bit of a thing if you add up the deaths over a few years. You know, that's a totally different conversation than going in and saying uh, the, the opposite, that we have one strategy that's going to help you live longer than the other. Okay, Brian, Courtney, please. Thanks. Uh, that was a, a great talk. And I really liked how you covered so many, you know, patient factors, anatomic factors, presentation aspects, local sort of capabilities. Um, it just highlights how many dimensions there are to making a decision that's in the patient's best interest and what the team is capable of doing. So um, I think that's a great approach. You know, when I'm thinking about, um, uh, I, I co-chair the heart team uh, uh, at our institution with one of our surgeons, Dr. Musa, and it does lead to some vibrant discussions around this. 
Um, and we're also looking at hybrid revascularization and some of the other things that are not measured or reflected in these trials, including things like pain scales, quality of life, return to work, that are typically not clinical outcomes, but often come up in that social or patient preference discussion. And I'm just trying to think of ways that we can quantify that going forward so that we can continue to incorporate that more objectively than perhaps we do um, at present. I wonder if you have any thoughts around that. Yeah, thank you. I, I, to me, this is really critical. At one, it, it highlights that we are comparing apples and oranges here, that people, patients are often thinking about the immediate discomfort, uh, an immediate post-procedure quality of life, uh, and weighing that against these longer term, harder outcomes is very difficult. And so quantifying that is useful. I think FAME 3 took a stab at it, looking at acute kidney injury, atrial fibrillation. You know, that's not something we think about at all. But what, what, what is the importance of needing to take an anticoagulant for the rest of your life? How does that figure into this? Um, Rehospitalization within 30 days. Uh, so those, those are items that start to get to this issue. Of what is the actual patient experience? And how can we quantify that? You know, there are, of course, quality of life scores, et cetera, with all their limitations. But I, I, I agree to me that that is ultimately how, how do we how do we find uh, how, what is going to be best for the patient's quality of life in the short and the long term, weigh that against length of life, et cetera. And it, it's very challenging. I don't have any great insight other than I think we are taking the lead from some of these recent trials at FAME 3. You know, maybe and with again, your experience. Just, oh, go, sorry, go ahead. You know, we treat a lot of ISR here. And so again, to me, it, emphasizing also just how impactful that is for patients' quality of life, these recurrent ISR lesions that are very hard to make real as a possibility for patients when you're having these discussions. And just, um, you know, from a PCI perspective there at the Brigham, are there any particular things that you're doing there that help get better outcomes in terms of um, or, or that you believe, even though you don't have the evidence, that might be new tricks that you're doing or new technologies that you're using to try and guide these left-brain interventions? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, a couple things. So one is just the use of imaging generally. So, you know, only two-thirds IVIS in uh, these trials in aggregate, but it's not even simply did somebody take out a catheter and bill for it, but how, how is that information being used? And so I, I think a systematic approach to imaging up front, understand the lesion, modify the lesion accordingly if there's calcium, et cetera, and then check your work on the back end. So we have a quite prospective or prescriptive approach to using imaging, whether IVIS or OCT, uh, to guide the intervention and check the work. Well, you know, hopefully that results in better outcomes, though uh, I obviously don't know exactly for this lesion subset. I personally have actually been de-escalating the use of mechanical support for these. I think there was mm -hmm. kind of a, a flare of interest, and I've actually found in a lot of these either doing nothing. I actually just put a pigtail via femoral artery, monitor EDP, and then deploy an impella if needed, or just use a balloon pump. And I've been actually doing a lot of these without anesthesia, balloon pump or nothing. And they've been going fine. <laughs> uh, and so I've been trying to sort of a less is more approach to the MCS, et cetera, being very particular about optimizing the PCI is sort of kind of where I think we are as a lab currently. And we've been pushing the, the imaging across PCIs and we now as a lab have sort of 80, 90% imaging for all PCIs, uh, which is and an important change. And the other ones that I think we've been interested locally here, the, the stents with stronger hoop strength for the osteolesions has at least conceptually been appealing um, to avoid that acute recoil issue that happens. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a very good point. Your, uh, your perspective on MCS is very forward thinking. And uh, in Canada, I think we, we haven't had as much resources or remuneration for it. Uh, so uh, we've really, um, uh, you know, constrained our use of it. So we've, we've, we've known about being able to do quite a lot without it for a very long time. So there may be a, you know, the circle may, <laughs> the circle may close on that eventually. Uh, and as we get more data about MCS as well. Um, any other questions uh, by the group? Dennis, did you have a question? Uh, no, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll just ask something that's um, a little bit different. Uh, um, I was wondering um, about the ruling out of the left main. So, you know, we talk a lot about left main and the ischemia trial uses CT angiogram to rule out left main, you know, 
they are at schools of thoughts, right? Like 50% left main, what, what's the significance of it? Um, and in a setting that we don't really, you know, it takes a while, there's a waiting list for um, CT angiogram. What would be your approach? Would you still kind of, before you do medical therapy, like do a CTA to real left main or you just do medical therapy? Uh, like what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, gosh, uh, it, it's just hard in the absence of data to not know the anatomy. And I, I do think for most people with a significant anginal symptom and abnormal non-invasive testing uh, imaging, I, I, I still kind of think it makes sense that in most of those patients, you should probably know what the coronary anatomy is. Uh, and so a, a coronary CT is a great way of doing that for many of these patients and just rule out anything that we think is high risk, though lack meaningful modern data to support that notion. So, you know, I, I, one way or another, I tend to want to know what's going on in there. Now, it's, of course, a challenge because if they've got a symptom and your first test is a coronary angiogram, it, there's a lot of temptation to just put in a stent once they're there and it's hard, it's hard to stop. And those are actually most those are like the hardest conversations you have with the patient. They say you found a blockage and you didn't do anything about it. Um, and now I'm just going to keep having this pain. Uh, so you, you got to have the conversation ahead of time, know why you're doing the test and make sure everybody's on board. Uh, but I, it leaves me a little uncomfortable not knowing the anatomy and, and sort of as a routine. Fair enough. Yeah, I think that's what we struggle as well. Once you put catheters in, it's almost invariably you have to fix something because you know you just a conversation with family. It's it's pretty much nonstop. Like they start calling you about you know something like they have you did an angiogram. Like it's not fixed. It's a it's much harder discussion. But I appreciate your insight. All right. Uh, any further comments or questions from the audience? And I just maybe just say one thing that they're around um, next week uh, for Manish Sud, uh, who is one of our clinical associate uh, as part of a job uh, uh, eval interview evaluation. So like it's a special rounds next week after family day. I hope uh, people would attend, but I'll stop there. Okay, uh, Eric. Thank, uh, oh, yeah, thank you. Just, just, uh, <laughs> just saying thank you. Just a clap, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. Okay, Brian, thank you very, very much for a great rounds, very clear presentation. We all enjoyed it. So uh, thank you appreciate so much, you taking yeah. the time. No, thank you so much. All right, have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye.